Hey guys, and welcome to another Walk-In Wednesday. Today I have a gun and then a series of guns that I want to show you. Uh, this you may recognize right away as a Browning High Power. It, uh, if you collect these, you can see pretty quickly that this is a late war Nazi high power, but it's even more special than that. I want to go into why this gun is particularly special and a rare find, but first let's back up a little bit and talk about the Browning High Power. Now a lot of uh, the information from this particular video comes from this book on Browning, uh, FN Browning High Powers, made in the Belgian factory, uh, by Anthony van der Linden. Uh, we highly recommend this book and we do make it available through our website if you'd like a copy. I'm getting a lot of my information from him. He did a great job on researching this. So the Brown, Browning High Power, actually John Browning uh, first made the uh, design for the Browning High Power and he died before he completed it. Uh, it was then picked up by the FN factory in Belgium and they completed the design in the late 1920s and went into production. It was also later licensed to Inglis in Canada because most of you know the uh, Inglis made a Browning High Power in Canada and then also Belgium was making a Browning High Power in Belgium. Now what made the Browning so revolutionary in terms of its design was the mag capacity. These were made in the early 1930s for the uh, Belgian army and you can see right away that this mag capacity was uh, revolutionary, bigger than anything else that was uh, offered at that time. It actually holds 13 rounds. You put one in the chamber, you're talking 14 rounds. Um, and so it was uh, a big step ahead in terms of technology. Uh, it was a big step ahead of all the other guns being produced at that time. And in fact, this, this design was used post-war by armies throughout the world. For this video, I want to just focus on three variations that were used in World War II by the Germans. As you know from history, but also watching our other videos, we did one on the, uh, on the Polish Radom. Uh, World War II started, uh, the fighting started in 1939, September, when Germany invaded Poland. Uh, they then went on to invade Belgium and France uh, in 1940. And by May of 1940, King Leopold III of Belgium, he uh, knew that they were no match for the German army. So he uh, surrendered the country uh, in order to save lives but also to save uh, many of their buildings and their history, architecture, uh, and things like that. However, uh, there's many reports of Belgian soldiers who refused to surrender and continue to stay in the field but were basically massacred uh, by the German mechanized divisions uh, coming through their country. They really were no match for the German army. So after the surrender, by September, Germans had taken over the factory and had already started producing their own weapons. Now, in other videos, uh, we've talked about where these weapons went um, because uh, we talked about the Waffen SS troops. They got a lot of the, a uh, lot of their munitions came from some of the captured countries. And so the Browning High Power, along with the Polish Radom, were actually favorites among the Waffen SS troops. Uh, so you will see pictures of Waffen SS and as a sidearm, many times they'll have uh, captured weapons such as the Browning High Power. So the first variation is a slotted tangent sight. Here's an example that was put together in the factory by the Germans in 1940. Uh, this one has all the Belgian proof, so it was issued to the Belgian army in about 1939 and uh, must have been in the factory when the Nazis took over in uh, 1940 because it's Belgian proof and then 613 proof. And therefore it is slotted and it is tangent sight, original finish, beautiful gun. But it also, um, the person that brought it in also had the stock. Now I've never seen a stock before, but looking in uh, van der Linden's book, this looks uh, like a correct stock. Uh, the holster seems small for a Browning high power, but when I try it out, it does fit in there nicely. And um, most importantly, this snaps on very easily. And therefore, you can, like an artillery Luger, you can steady it. And uh, actually, this looks like it'd be a lot of fun to shoot. So I might have to try this one out. Again, first time I've ever seen the high power with the stock. So this is a very rare find. Now this one is not numbered to the gun, which tells me this was a commercial 
uh, stock. The, the military ones, again, reading in the book, it says they were numbered to the gun. This must be a commercial stock that somebody just put with this gun. So I don't think it was issued with a gun, but nonetheless, it's very cool to have the two of these together. Here's another one of the first variations, which would mean tangent sight and slotted. This one is a little bit different. Uh, the last one had Belgian proof. This one has the uh, logo. You can see the FN logo, which is Fabrique Nationale. I, I just said FN a lot, um, and I just realized you may not know that that stands for Fabrique Nationale. You can see the logo here, and you see the 613 proof. Uh, all of the proofs are, you know, they're, they're kind of muddled a bit. They're hard to read, but that's just because they were quickly putting the stamps on. Uh, they only made this variation one uh, for a couple of months, September to December of 1940, or approximately September to December, a few months. Uh, they made the slotted, so the, the uh, production is very, very low. Uh, this is a very rare find, slotted, 613 with the tangent sight. Also, no, some people call this the artillery sight, but probably more commonly referred to as the tangent sight. Um, so this is a variation one with just, just the Nazi proofs, 613 proofs. By the way, if you find one, uh, don't be surprised if you see price tags of $5,000 to $6,000 due to the rarity of this variation. Now, this is an example of the variation two. It's very simple to recognize and a lot more common. There's no slot for the lug slot. They didn't use it anyway, so the Germans did away with it, but it does still have the tangent sight. Now, for the, about the first, it is approximate, about the first six months, they still, they had the tangent with a 613 proof, but then the inspector proof changed to 103. And so for the second six months of 1941, you'll see, uh, the one, 103 proof. And this is a great example if you look through this gun. You can see the serial range, front strap is beautiful. Um, I mentioned the 103 proof, which you can see on the slide and the frame. It's also on the front. Uh, you can see it on the front of the gun. And then one other spot on the spine um, of the magazine, you can see the 103 proof as well. So these came as a rig in a holster with two magazines. So we're talking about two 13 round magazines. You could see why the Waffen SS really preferred this weapon. Okay, before I jump to the third variation, which uh, started in 1942, somewhere in the transition at the end of 41 and going into 42, I have a 140 proof. Uh, this is a tangent sight, of course, no slot, uh, but you see a, a tangent sight and a 140 proof, uh, which again began at the end of 1941 and into the beginning of 1942. Again, a beautiful condition, Browning high power. You can see the serial number is, is a bit later. Uh, you can see the tangent sight. Um, but this, this transitions then into the third variation where they did away with the tangent sight. I can only imagine that the German soldiers didn't really use this very much. It's, it was for close combat. I mean, you didn't pull this out. Uh, to shoot uh, soldiers across the field. This is a last ditch where you're, you're being uh, charged and you just uh, pull it out of your holster and open fire. So who the heck needs a tangent sight? So the third variation, the Germans cut cost and simplified production. Again, the goal was to make these as fast as possible and get them out the door. We now have 140 proof, no slot, no more tangent. So it's considered fixed sight, which by the way, um, all the other German weapons such as the Luger and the P-38 had fixed front and rear sights. So this takes us to uh, 1943 and 1944. Uh, the remainder of those two years, the guns uh, had no tangent sight and this was the look. Uh, 140 proof. Again, it'll also be proofed on the front and you will see a 140 proof on the spine. Now I will make one uh, comment about the, the proof on the spine is always so faint I can barely read it. If I'm at a gun show I can never see it until I get home and I actually uh, get a magnifying glass and look. Sometimes I'm surprised because I get it home and it'll be uh, 103 proofed which is a nice bonus because they're a lot more rare. So this one has a, a 140 proof barely visible um, and it does have wooden grips, although at the, very, at the very end in 1944, they went to a plastic grip, just like the, um, 
the Luger went to a plastic grip right at the end of production. So this is the, the more common Browning High Power that you will f see available to collectors on our website as, other, as well as other websites. This one actually is on our website right now. You can see it right here. Um, and it comes with this holster. The uh, High Power holster is very distinct. Uh, usually the date is right under here. Uh, this one is dated 44, but usually you'll find the maker and the date right under this strap. Uh, but is the reason it's so distinct, it looks at first like a P38 holster, but um, you can see the size of the magazine well is uh, particularly large. So whenever I see one of these, I go, oh, a P38 holster, and then I turn it sideways and I realize it's a Browning high power holster, which sells for a little bit more than the P38 holster, a little more rare. This is in beautiful condition, has an extra magazine, and it does look like this magazine has a 140 proof, although I can't really read the numbers, but if you look up there, look very closely, you can probably see it. And we're just, uh, we'll just wrap up our video with this final uh, gun, which is, isn't really a variation of its own. It's just kind of a glitch. Um, you can see that it has the plastic grips that you would have at End of War. Also, End of War, there's only one proof mark. They weren't wasting their time putting lots of proof marks. And uh, it does have a suffix. This one has a B suffix, which was the last of the ones made. So there's an A suffix and B suffix, and then production ended because uh, Germany was uh, pushed out uh, by the American Army and the British Army. Uh, they were pushed out of uh, Belgium, so they left the factory. Uh, so this one was one of the last ones made. Now here's what makes it uh, so cool. Um, looks like a standard late war production, but take a look at that. How about that? Slotted. And that is not fake. Uh, you would think this doesn't exist, but if you uh, get van der Linden's book, you will see at the end of the war, just like the Walther factory, if you go back and watch our video about the Walther factory, they will, they will say that at the end of the war, they were using up discarded parts. And so a lot of those parts was, were from pre-war period or early war production. Uh, in this case, this is a very late war uh, gun. They were using up old parts, and they happened to have a slotted 140, no tangent, very cool gun. Glad this walked in. I hope you enjoyed our video. Make sure you like and subscribe, share this with some other people who might be interested, and make sure you hit the notification bell so that you know when we put out another video.